I was also looking at a story um, late last night on the record number of gang members that New Zealand has noted um, through something called uh, the Gang Harm Insights Centre, who have reported that we are growing our number of gang members, who I've always described, and rightly so, I think, even when I was mayor, as petty terrorists, anti-social saboteurs of society. We are growing our gang members by six new gang members a day, and that the number of gang official gang members on this list is now 8,357, and that doesn't include gang prospects, gang associates, um, gang wannabes, or a whole series of youth who would aspire to be in them. Gangs have become the story of our life, and they have inspired, and that is the proper word, a whole series of young people um, to that lifestyle. So they are aspirational, not like my children to sit exams and pass qualifications and get a good job and go on to further tertiary studies. No, not at all. They are aspirational to enter this new world, uh, and gangs are, if you like, the portals. They are the, um, the doorman to that life. Um, joining us to talk about this, um, and also, I guess, whether or not we have the resources, uh, the human power, um, or the will to make a difference in this area is the President of New Zealand um, Police Association, Chris Cahill. Chris, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. Um, yes, I did worry about that. I, I get concerned now, I, and I think my concern would be felt throughout New Zealand, that there seems to be no ending of two things. One, gang membership increasing, but two, this clear defiance, this um, awareness that for gang members and their associates, there really aren't too many consequences from their antisocial behaviour. Does your membership feel similar? Yeah, look, they do. And and look, if I can just go back to what you, you talked about education, and this is linked to the gangs as well. I mean, when you've got only you know, up to 60% of kids not engaging with education in the last term at school, where do you think the gang is going to recruit from? They're going to recruit out of that 60% of people that haven't got an education. So, you know, we're really failing our future on this issue as well. But, you know, to ask your point, are the, you know, is there no consequences? It certainly seems like that at times. And, you know, I think the public of New Zealand, they see it, whether it's in Auckland, whether it's in rural New Zealand, whether it's in provincial New Zealand, they're seeing their gang members out there in their patches being brazen every single day. And it's, it's getting pretty frustrating. Um, so I think we've got to look at some drastic changes. Well, I'll tell you something. It sort of made me feel sad. Uh, a, a, a little bit, I was cynical to start with, but then my, my, my attitude changed to sadness. There was um, the tribesman, I think, last week, you'll be aware of it, and there was, um, I think it was the 40th, they were celebrating their 40th anniversary since their formation. And there were a whole series of um, um, uniformed police people stopping them as they were going down the road on some sort of rally. Um, and I think they dished out something like 160 um traffic infringement tickets and I thought gee is that what we've got to is that and and, and I, I know that under Co Operation Cobalt they thought well this is sort of an harassment um, program that we hope will sort of oh I don't know stop them in their tracks but if we've got to dissing out traffic infringement tickets on this level that's not attacking gangs is it? Uh, look it's a, it's it's part of the, the solution, a very small part, and that is to make the life of being a gang member uncomfortable and difficult and not worth it. And that's at the bottom end, but at the top end, it's things like taking their assets off them. Uh, that's the big one to us. And it doesn't mean all the big assets either. So there's, there's currently uh, a law going through at that select committee stage to amend the asset recovery or asset seizure laws. Yeah. And, 
And well, this really needs to pass, but it needs to be amended from its current form. Justice have stuck their fingers in the pie and, oh, and muddied the waters with a $30,000 threshold. So that's basically saying you can get $30,000 worth of illicit um, money and use it to buy motorbikes and other things, and that's all okay. But that is a real missed opportunity because if police can take the Harley Davidsons off the gang members, that's a real um, takes away one of the big incentives to join a gang. And it's also taking them off their associates and even their family if it's the gang member that's using that but then putting it in the mother's name who never, never rides the bike. And then the young kids looking aren't seeing these gang members in their neighbourhoods with the big flash motorbikes. So we're really keen to see those amendments go through. Um, why would justice do that? I mean, I, I've, the Justice Department seem to be full of gang, either gang familiars in the sense that, you know, um, they almost seem to want to encourage them. But what, what really seems to drive them is that they believe that gang members are civil members of society and their civil rights should not be infringed. They've thought that for a long, long time, haven't they, Chris? Yeah, they're certainly coming from a different angle than, than police on the front line are. And they're missing the whole point that this could be a massive prevention opportunity, a massive way to take away the incentive. They're worried that the courts are going to get bogged down with all these applications around $30,000. Police are too busy for that. But what they'll do is target it into areas that will make the most difference. So, you know, you've got gangs out of control in Flaxmere. Let's take the bikes off those gang members in Flaxmere. And it sends a really clear message to that community. And, and don't think the community leaders won't think it's great too. They don't want to see all these gang members being the ones that look to have money and sending the wrong message to kids who instead of going to school want to join a gang. Mm. I, I understand what you're saying, but this legislation that's going to go through Parliament is designed more to attack, as I understand, oh, I don't know, the head of the mongrel mob in Hastings or the tribesman leader in Auckland. Is, is that right? It's really designed more for those folk? Well, we think it can, if they get rid of that $30,000 threshold, we think it can actually be used uh, at a planned way of targeting the lower level ones, taking away that incentive. And while I'm not, I'm not saying that we're going to run around taking everything off everyone, but the, the, clearly the things that drive the recruitment into gangs if we can take those assets away, it sends a really clear message. And, mm. and you would do it when you're following up. I'll give you an example. We did a really good operation a few years ago um, in, in the central North Island. And we, we, took, we worked with Iwi. So Oakley, we knew, knew we were doing a drug job. And we took the drugs out of the community, we locked up the offenders, and we took their assets away. And the local community actually saw the holistic approach that we took. And we also put in um, drug rehabilitation stuff around it as well, where they were willing to take it. And that's the sort of approach you can take, so that the young people in that community actually saw the gangs losing their assets. So that's why we want to see this legislation go through, but with, um, without the 30,000 threshold. Um, although there are 8,357 registered gang members at the moment, uh, as counted by this um, Insight Centre, what's your take on the number of associates and prospects that are associated with gangs in New Zealand? Do I double the number or what? Yeah, I think you could pretty easily. Um, I think, yeah, it is only a number too. I mean, we've got to, they, they say it's not accurate because it doesn't, take who drops out of gangs. Well, most people don't leave a gang, but they probably do, do get less active as they get older and aren't, aren't necessarily driving the crime of some of the younger members. But you could double that with the associates, um, without a doubt. And, and of course, as, as I've said, you know, the young ones are the ones that are joining. They're the ones we've got to stop, we've got to engage with in a different way. Mm. Uh, very difficult to do so. The other thing, for phenomena that's happened over the last uh, probably 10 years, really, the last decade, is the social media uh, glorifying um, everything from ram raids to the amount of money, cash, drugs, um, bling um, that gang members have. Uh, I guess if you're a 15-year-old, 14-year-old, 13-year-old Maori boy who's failed at school in Flaxmere and ain't going anywhere in a hurry, that is always going to be enduringly attractive, isn't it? It is, and that's why, you know, I've, I've talked about 
take their bikes off them so the young kids aren't going to see them on their bikes. The next one is something that you've been involved in before is take their patches off. Yeah, them. Yeah, I think yeah. it's time to ban the patches. Yeah. So if you think about it, if you can't ride around on your <clears> motorbike and you can't walk around with your patch, actually there's two of the big reasons to join a gang gone yeah, yeah. Um, straight away. Actually, what's the point? I can't do any of those things. So I think we really need to look hard at that gang, uh, patch ban legislation. Um, I think it's, it's given the proliferation, the continued growth, it's time to give a real crack at that, I think. Can I tell you my experience in Wanganui was that it worked and was working. Um, we found, and, but the funny, the really interesting thing was that I was contacted by a Hell's Angels partner. Um, this is only anecdotal, but she said it was the first time that she actually felt safe walking down the street with her husband because he was he, did, he couldn't wear the colours anymore, and so she got her husband back. And I thought, wow, I had never thought of that as an insight from the point of view that you've got to adopt a different persona when you've got your patch or your colours on, don't you? Of course you do. You know, um, and we've seen that with these gang fights erupting at fast food outlets and things where they simply bump into each other, but they have to live up to that patch yeah. on their back. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not saying these people should go to prison for wearing a patch. I think it should be simply... Mate, take your patch off. We see you wearing again in the next three months. We're going to seize it. You seize it. You might keep it for three months. Do it again. You lose it for good. Things like simple as that. No one going near a prison. You just lose your patch. Those sorts of things, um, I think, are well worth trying. Um, what about the morale within the police at the moment? Um, how would you judge it in comparison? I mean, you've been around for a while, Chris, so when did you first... Get sworn in. Yep, I've been around it. I've been around it longer than I almost want to remember, to be honest. And I've seen a lot. And I've worked right across New Zealand. Look, it, it, it's there's a lot of re we've we've recruited you know, nearly, uh, probably over four thousand cops in the last five years. So there's a bunch of young, <coughs> new, fresh-faced officers with a much more diverse uh, view of the world. We've got a much better Pacifica, Maori. Asian, so it's it's really changed, and I've really noticed that going out and meeting the young officers, and they're enthusiastic as ever. But in saying that, they're really struggling with the demand, and it's that demand that never seems to end. I mean, sixty percent increase in family harm attended in the last five years, and it continues to grow. Mental health, and I'm not sure these young cops ever thought that they were actually going to be mental health workers and family counsellors, because, yeah. I mean, 108,000 events police attended family harm last year actually had no criminal element of offending at all. So I think that's wearing them down and just taking away, you know, some of their enthusiasm. But they're great people. But, you know, it doesn't take much, you know. You, I've seen some really good drug um, arrests and then you see the offenders getting home detention and you start saying, is it ever worth it? Is it even worth all that effort? So there's some challenges. Uh, yesterday on the show, we interviewed um, uh, somebody from Black Ribbon, which is uh, a group of people that argue that um, that domestic violence is a is it should not be gender based. It should be just treated on whoever is the protagonist and whoever is the victim. And a suggestion that um, men are often victims as well. One of the th aspects of that discussion, Chris, was related to the police view that it's always, and this is what I want to discuss with you, um, it's always the man that is regarded by the police as the primary protagonist in a domestic disturbance um, and likely to, and, and is arrested. Is that police policy or is that just um, something that has arisen over the last wee while? Well, it's, it's, it's the reality of what police see most of the time. And, and look, police have a, a very clear duty when they turn up an event to understand all the facts and to listen to both sides. But the reality, where is the risk? Who kills who? Males kill females in domestic violence situations. That's, that's the reality. Well, not all, no, there are plenty of women that have killed men in a wee while, and, um, and, cer and certainly the, the number of um, child murders in this country is, is, is relatively gender uh, equal, I have to say. Yeah, and, and that's certainly the role that police have to play in um, making sure that they understand all the facts. And, and, but, but I would suggest that 
there is definitely the risk level they see is with the is more with the male, so that does influence them. But the real the real issue is when they leave. Most addresses, as I said, 108,000 of the events they attended last year actually had no criminal offending, but doesn't mean that many of those families didn't mean intervention. The real challenge is who does the intervention, because police aren't equipped to carry on with that intervention after that. That needs to go to another group altogether. And when you're talking about that 108,000 events, are you talking not just uh, male v female? Um, no, and have all all, all fat. So. So police attend, I can't remember the exact figure off the top of my head of how many family harm incidents they attended, but 108,000 of them actually had no criminal offending. Yeah, so you'd argue, yeah, argue yeah. why are police tying up so much of their time at all those events? I do recognise that you don't want to get it wrong either, though. You, know, you don't want to not attend an event that ends up in, a, in serious harm. So that is the challenge. Um, and I guess the other thing for uh, folk... Uh, and who see the gangs and, and then they see the, the, the only time you're ever likely to see a police officer is if you get caught speeding which it's not a very um, a, you know positive interaction as a general rule but burglaries and stealing from cars really low clearance rates Chris they haven't got any better I think they've probably even declined um, that also doesn't send a signal to criminals that if I commit these relatively petty but profitable um, acts against people, uh, burglary, stealing from cars, etc. Um, I'm going to get away with it because there doesn't seem to be a direct police intervention into that area. What, what's, what would you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a fair accusation to make. I mean, we had a, a report out from the Independent Police um, um, Conduct Authority last week around the police response to fraud, which was also woeful. Um, even though some people are losing, you know, tens of thousands, if not more, the the reality it comes back to that demand I talked about, and where police can actually deploy their resources, and it, and they've made a conscious decision to look where there's physical harm or uh, normally physical some will be mental or in sexual offending as well it may not be totally physical but um that's where they've decided to put the majority of their resources because they simply can't respond to all these events and i totally get how frustrating that is but as I've talked about, police need to get out of things like mental health. That's not their area. It's a health issue, not a criminal issue. They need to look at all these family harm incidents that actually aren't criminal and say, is that really police that should be attending those? And that then frees up the staff to do a lot more of the what you might call traditional policing that members of the public want. Understand, I understand what you're it. saying, but if you're not doing that, either the mental health call-outs, and um, you're right, there seem to be a lot of folk particularly hanging around CBDs of our centres and cities at the moment, um, and those family harm interventions. If you're not doing that, who else does? That, and, that's, and that's the challenge. I mean, you know, we, we saw a report yesterday, you know, there's not one extra bed in the mental health facilities, uh, uh, even though they've had, you know, something like a billion dollars spent on it. That's the real challenge. We're just not meeting that demand around other things from other government departments aren't stepping up. So police as a 24-7 organisation keep getting stuck having to deal with issues that really aren't traditional policing and, and I don't believe should should be occupying their time and, and then that then police aren't able to meet the demand for those other areas you've just talked about. Yeah. And finally, mate, um, you've... Was, I didn't know that, but thank you for that stat. 4,000 new police recruited over the last five years. That's a phenomenal number. Can I ask, and you've talked about the diversity being there, can I ask whether or not, um, and I, I'm going to tread warily on this, and I guess you will on your reply too, but is the standard, is the quality um, there? Do we recruit wings that you could look at now, Chris, and go... They're as good as any wings we've ever had, or in the need to recruit new numbers, are we dropping standards? I remember, oh, you probably do too, about 10 or 15 years ago, there were headlines about police recruits being unable to spell, so they couldn't write out reports properly um, when they were filing them. Have the standards got better, worse, about the same, do you think? Yeah, well, well, firstly, if 60% of our, our kids aren't going to school regularly, we'll soon have to recruit police that can't read and write because <laughs> no, one in the, no one in the country will be able to do it. But, no, look, 
look, to be honest, um, this is a question I get asked all the time. And look, I can tell you, when I joined, I was useless compared with the wing in front of me. And we've always said that, oh, they're no good anymore. No, nah, look, the, the new recruits, they're probably better. Um, the top end, I'd say, are better. Um, they've got much higher qualifications. They bring a lot more diverse skills. Many of them have multiple languages. Every time I go, I go out to every, try to get to every graduation. I talk to every recruit. I'm amazed about some of the skills that we're getting brought into the police, um, and the fact that it's just been able to continue year after year. Um, so overall, look, I think it, I'm, I think we're getting some amazing people. I think the challenge will be to keep them. Um, when they see what they're actually getting bogged down doing. I think that's the biggest risk we suffer. Mm, I, I hear you on that. I really do hear you on that one. I understand because you're saying we recruited these people. They thought they were going to be doing this and they've ended up doing this. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. finally, Kahu Kura, the mongrel mob meth program. <laughs> um, uh, you, I hear the cynical laugh. Um, I take it nothing surprises you about that you think it was all window dressing from day one yeah. look I, I make the point you know when you've been around policing as long as i have you you return into a cynic but look i've been there i've seen it all before i remember years ago i was uh, working in hawks bay i was running the drug squad there and um, I was giving public talks around the harm of methamphetamine and leaders of the Black Power were getting up and saying, uh, we totally reject methamphetamine, it's bad, we don't support it. And I was running live wire jobs where the president of the Black Power was, was manufacturing methamphetamine. So I think, I think the mongrel mob in Hawke's Bay are the biggest sellers of methamphetamine in Hawke's Bay. So if they want to run a scheme to get people off methamphetamine, the best thing to do is stop selling the stuff. And, and look, Sonny Smith is a very active gang leader. And so it's very hard for me or any police officer in Hawke's Bay to think that this is a genuine program. I mean, it, it looks... So what a scheme. You sell the methamphetamine. If you get caught, the police will take your money off you. The government will give it back to you. You then run a scheme that the person selling the meth goes on graduates without any oversight that it's actually been done properly and the judge gives them a discount for the sentence for the selling the meth in the first place. It's a great scheme. So I'm no, I'm sorry, I'm way too cynical that this is just a big have. Thank you so much. I'm sure you're 100% right. Chris, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Michael. Okay, see you later, mate. Uh, that's Chris Carhill, uh, President, New Zealand Police Association. It's Carhill, not Cahill, sorry. Uh, my apologies. Uh, and I think, <coughs> pardon me, that last 30 seconds of that interview, <coughs> mm, you know what I mean.